Okie dokie. Good morning, people. Welcome to today's presentation on cascade control. Uh, this is in the process subject uh, area, ILM 310-305E, cascade control. So cascade control, pretty big, pretty important. Uh, out there far more than you probably realize. After today, you'll look at the things in a different way. So let's figure out why. Cascade control is a common advanced control strategy, very common. It improves the performance compared to conventional control. That's why we use it. We must understand how these loops operate as they are much more common than you may think. If you haven't figured out yet, they're quite common. Objectives. Explain the advantages and applications of cascade control. Explain the failure mode considerations and actions for control loops. Explain how the effective time constant of the inner loop is reduced using cascade control. And this number three here is basically the hinge pin for cascade control. So we'll make sure that you understand what's going on here for objective three. Number four, identify and explain the methods for tuning cascade control systems, which is always fun. And last, we will sketch a block diagram of a cascade control system. So pretty basic set of objectives here. So let's get on the first one here, explaining the advantages and applications of cascade control. So let's see what that means to us. Cascade control, by definition, is any control scheme where the output of one controller is used as the set point of another. Its main purpose is to reduce the effects of a load disturbance to the manipulated variable on the controlled variable. So if we look at our steam exchanger example, for example here, the idea of someone in the plant taking some of the steam away from our plant, creating load disturbance to our plant, which could cause the oil temperature of our product to go down, uh, that can be a problem. Um, with normal control, you won't notice that until your oil temperature starts to drop generally, and Cascade kind of closes the door on that potentiality happening. So we're going to compare uh, conventional control with Cascade control to kind of show you that difference. So fundamentally, if we looked at a couple of different uh, versions of a control loop here, a con uh, conventional loop here on this distillation column, uh, we have temperature transmitter and a controller controlling the steam flow, uh, which is uh, heating our product. We have a flow transmitter at the top controlling our feed. And that's pretty standard. Temperature is controlled here, our feed flow is controlled here. They're separate from each other and everything is is everything is absolutely fantastic. But if we were to say, for example, get uh, a loss of steam over here, our temperature uh, would start to drop a little bit here. Our feed would continue feeding uh, cold product into here, basically, which would cause our product to drop temperature even more, uh, which is problematic. So we throw in a cascade loop here. Uh, which you can see now has a temperature temp transmitter controller, a flow transmitter and a controller, and this unique feature here called a remote set point. So this is really how the cascade thing works here. We have the temperature transmitter measuring the temperature of the column, feeding that signal into the temperature controller, which used to control the valve, but now it feeds its set point into the flow controller, saying that if my temperature isn't right, if it's going up or going down, I am going to want this flow controller to either increase or decrease my steam so that I can maintain my temperature. So you see it kind of gets rid of that particular problem. So now, for example, if I was to lose uh, steam uh, pressure, someone turns on another unit and I lose steam pressure here, the flow transmitter is going to pick that up right away. It's going to open the flow control valve. It's going to allow more steam in here to heat our uh, distillation column and we're not going to get that drop in temperature. So that's the whole premise of cascade um, of cascade control. I'm going to, I can probably do most of the lecture just on this here slide. So you'll notice extra hardware required here. So it does come with some expense. We have two transmitters now, we have two controllers, 
two process penetrations, uh, a little bit more I.O. used on the, on the DCS, um, and a little bit more complicated to set up, but it is beneficial in the long run. So let's look at what that looks like here. Uh, if we looked at the example I just explained, comparing conventional and cascade, this is what would happen based on a drop in steam pressure. So conventional control here, everything is running fine, and then all of a sudden I get a drop in steam pressure. That's going to cause uh, the temperature in my uh, column to go down, and it's going to cause um, my steam flow to go down, and it's going to cause my temperature to drop. With cascade control, we'll see that my steam pressure drops, but the steam flow, that flow transmitter that we've added in there, compensates for it by increasing its signal, and we maintain our product temperature. So this is the reason why we have cascade control. So upsets to our manipulated variable, and in this case, steam pressure, end up not having a significant effect on our controlled variable, which in this case is the temperature. That's why we use cascade control. So some terms we need to come to grips with here, cascade control uh, uses two controllers and one final control element, and they have unique names uh, and lots of different unique names. And you'll see me refer to these uh, abbreviated after this slide here. So first of all, uh, the controller that directly controls a manipulated variable is called the secondary, slave, or inner controller. And I will usually abbreviate this into SSI. The controller whose output is the set point of the secondary is called the primary, the master, or the outer controller. And the, and the primary controller is the one that's attached to the uh, the process that we're most concerned about. In this case, it's column, uh, in this case, it's column temperature here. So our primary master or outer controller, PMO, is our main controller, the TIC 101. And the secondary slave, SSI, or inner controller, is this flow controller. So we have to be very aware of those two different terms here. <clears throat> so the advantages of cascade control over conventional uh, control, the response speed of the primary loop improves because the slave loop is faster. So in our application where we look at this one here, we've got temperature, which is a very slow acting loop, and we have flow, which is a very fast acting loop. And if we don't understand that yet, you better grasp it really quick, right? We make a change to the set point of a flow transmitter, it changes right now. Uh, we make a set point change to a temperature transmitter or a temperature controller, it's going to take some time. We need that time difference in order for cascade to work. Okay, non-linearities non uh, in our slave loop are now handled by the slave controller. So that's not really a super significant point, but um, now that we have an additional controller in our slave loop, uh, we get all the benefits of, of having a controller on it, which helps us to reduce those nonlinearities. Um, it also, Cascade also has that additional transmitter, therefore we get more information on our, on our process so we can make things work a little bit better. Uh, that also comes with uh, obviously some expense as well. So for Cascade to be a benefit, the slave loop must be faster than the primary loop. And the specifications in the ILM, I think, say three, three times faster, but the general industry rule is three to five times faster. And how do you know what this three to five times faster is? It's easy. You basically, the easy way to do it is to compare the T1 times. Uh, you make a change on the flow transmitter, uh, you measure its T1 time, you make a change on the temperature transmitter, you measure its T1 time, and then it becomes pretty obvious to see. So in order to determine uh, another way to do that, of course, is to use the period of oscillation. It's a little bit more complicated, but as I said, uh, using the first order time constant or the T1 time is probably the easiest way to uh, determine whether or not you've got that time differential that you need. Okay, so again, to just reiterate, level, level loops take a long time in the neighborhood of minutes. 
or maybe longer, flow loop changes fast, like milliseconds or seconds. And that's why this scheme will work because that secondary loop is much, much faster than the primary loop. We'll talk now specifically about the most common secondary loop. Um, and that is a valve with a positioner. Uh, and this is why cascade is uh, very, very common because nowadays almost every valve does have a positioner on it. And when we do that, we're essentially making the valve and the positioner its own individual loop because it provides its own feedback. And then we have our temperature controller, temperature transmitter, which is uh, the other loop. And just to keep it simple for now. So uh, what the positioner does is it adjusts that valve so it's always on set point, right, as opposed to an I to P, which we would never know. Uh, it's in there. It just it will overcome any line pressure. Uh, that might be trying to open it more and compensate if the line pressure goes down and the valve wants to follow it. It basically just looks after the valve. Uh, another common problem that's eliminated with the positioner is called valve stiction. Uh, and we've mentioned valve stiction a couple of different times. And that's caused again by uh, tight packing that prohibits um, smooth movement of the valve stem. And back in the days when we just used I to P's, if we made a, a change to a valve output, for example, we changed it from 8 milliamps to 12 milliamps. Um, the pressure uh, is changed, is allowed to change by the I to P, but we have no verification that that pressure is going to be enough to overcome valve stiction. So the valve might open more, it might not open more. And we have no way of knowing because there's no feedback. Positioners bring that. Um, so that's why positioners are what they call the most common, uh, the most common secondary loop. So positioners are typically used on valves two inches larger, um, except on flow loops, flow loops, which usually have a unique dynamics. So we're not too worried about that particular detail. So another common control uh, or secondary loop is the flow loop. It's probably the most common secondary loop uh, out there because again, it's probably the fastest reacting process out of all of them, whether it's uh, gas pressure, liquid pressure, um, temperature level, whatever it happens to be, flow is fast. Um, in this example here, <clears throat> this is our fancy steam exchanger. Um, the temperature controller here is the primary master or outer loop, and the flow controller here is the secondary slave or inner loop. The TIC output here you see is the remote set point for the secondary controller. And again, temperature is slow, flow is fast. So this meets the criteria for cascade control. What do we get out of this? Well, we get to eliminate stiction because we know where the valve position is. And if it's not where it's supposed to be, the positioner will allow more pressure to go to the actuator and move that valve to where it needs to be. It also handles manipulated variable disturbances on its own because it's, has, it's got a transmitter here telling the uh, controller if there's any error. And the primary final control element is more linear, again, due to the positioning. Engineering units typically used in secondary in the secondary loop. So typically you're going to have uh, 0 to 100% in the secondary loop. But again, that's not a real significant detail. Temperature. Temperature control loop, um, we can, uh, and this is kind of an odd circumstance, but here's a, a furnace, for example, here, uh, that's got a regenerator attached to it. Uh, we can do a temperature controller, temperature controller cascade loop, providing that the secondary loop is faster. Again, it has to be faster, or there's no benefit to even bothering. So here, the furnace temperature changes faster than the regener temp regenerator temperature. Uh, and because of that, we get all the benefits we can get from Cascade here. So again, eating, heating the air in a furnace, and this is kind of just stuff you have to wrap your head around. Heating the air in the furnace is probably faster than heating uh, the media that's in the regenerator. There's probably catalyst and other stuff in there that just takes longer. <clears throat> other loops. Pick whatever you like. Um, as long as the secondary is three times faster than the primary, Cascade can work for you. Okay, so those are all, that's all secondary loop stuff. Primary loop stuff here, 
Um, primary variable also can be anything as long as it stands to benefit from the cascade scheme. There are some loops that don't necessarily need one, uh, like gas pressure and liquid level. Uh, they just tend to be more or less controllable uh, the way they are. They're, you know, in that medium-ish area, I guess is what I'll leave that at. But um, again, if, if you have that ability where you've got a uh, possibility to, to use something that's faster, to change something that's slower, a cascade uh, can be something that you can use. Higher level cascade loops. Um, looking at this drawing here, you can see that there's four different cascade loops. We have the FIC to the positioner as one cascade loop. So this flow controller is putting uh, its set point into the uh, remote set point of the positioner. We have TIC uh, 201 feeding its output signal into the remote set point of FIC 201. We have TIC 101 feeding its output into the remote set point portion of TIC 201. And we also have the set point to the regen um, made by the operator. So a bunch of different cascade loops in there. And that's why I say they're, they say that they're very common. Uh, they're so common that they almost exist everywhere and we just never really kind of think about them. So cascade, very common, very beneficial in lots of applications. Disadvantages. Wow. Can there be? Well, there is, but they're not terrible disadvantages. First of all, we need two controllers to configure. We need two controllers to tune. We got to buy two controllers. Uh, we got to make two process penetrations. We got to have two transmitters. Uh, we're going to use more IO. So overall, it's fairly minor, I guess, um, in, in overall looking at the benefits that you could get from cascade control. Moving to objective two, explain failure mode considerations and control actions for cascade loops. So this will be a little bit of review uh, of some of the stuff you, we covered in second year, uh, talking about controller actions and failure modes. And let's just do a quick little bit of review here. I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time um, talking about this because there's a couple of different ways to do it and my way is not necessarily always the best way you might have a different way to do it but we'll let you decide as we see what uh, we got in the next couple of slides here so a uh, quick review here controller is reverse acting if its output needs to go down when the PV increases so if the input uh, goes up and the valve closes it's reverse acting and the controller is direct acting if its output needs to go up when the PV increases. So again, not gonna to try to confuse you with that. You should understand that by now. The transmitter, final control element, processing controller, all have an option of being reverse or direct acting. If the combination of the transmitter, final control element, and process is positive, the controller then must be reverse acting. Remember this? If the combination of the transmitter, final control element, and pro process is negative, then the controller must be direct acting. And that sounds very, very confusing, but it's pretty easy to determine if you don't get confused, which often happens. But most of the time, we can talk our way through it. Um, to determine this, we'll start at the secondary controller. So let's have a look-see. Here's an example. If we look at the diagram here of our steam exchanger, we've got a flow controller, we've got a temperature controller, which one is primary and which one is secondary. If you're shaking your head right now and you're going, I have no idea, remember that in a cascade loop, the primary feeds its output to the secondary as a remote set point. So primary is a temperature controller, secondary is the flow controller, so let's look at these separately. Let's, let's uh, start with the secondary, as it said in the previous slide. So uh, start at the transmitter here. So if the steam flow goes up, the signal from the temperature transmitter goes up. Right? Good with that? If the transmitter 
signal is increasing to the flow controller. The flow controller signal is going to do what? This is a fail control valve. So if I increase the signal from the flow controller to the valve, it is going to open, right? Increasing signal, increasing flow. See, this is how it's easy to get confused because I'm already there. So if the steam flow goes up, I want this to be uh, reverse acting, so negative. Uh, if my signal going to the valve increases, the flow increases, so the valve is positive. This is probably confusing you, I'm just saying. Okay, uh, again, temperature transmitter, if the oil temperature goes up, the temperature transmitter signal goes up, so it's positive. Uh, if the signal coming into the controller is going up, temperature is getting higher, what do I need the valve to do? I need the valve to, to close, so that means I need the temperature controller to be reverse acting or negative. Does that make sense to you guys there? Um, again, looking at the flow valve here, uh, it's an increasing signal causes an increase in flow, so the valve is positive. That's basically how you go about how you basically go about figuring it out. Um, I'm not going to try to make that more confusing. Um, I hope you're not all confused. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure where we're at in the classroom. It's a little bit easier to. Uh, do it. So uh, the secondary, the flow transmitter is direct acting, meaning that an increase in steam re results in an increase in its output. The flow controller or uh, final control element is direct acting, meaning that an increase in signal in results in an increased opening. The process itself is direct acting, meaning that an increase in the final control element opening results in an increase in steam flow. If any one of those is negative, the loop itself is negative. So in the primary, the flow transmitter is direct acting, meaning that an increase in temperature results in an increase in its output. The flow controller is direct acting, meaning an increase in its signal results in increased opening of the valve. The process is direct acting, meaning that an increase in steam results in an increased temperature. I hope I haven't confused you. At any rate, uh, that's how we figure that out. So looking at the controller modes, uh, in order to have cascade capabilities, the controllers must have the cascade input. Uh, the cascade input is usually called remote set point, and it also has to have a cascade selector. So normally we're used to auto and manual. Now we have auto, manual, and cascade. So these are the three modes. <coughs> Excuse me. The controller can then be operated in any of these three modes. Um, using a uh, selector here. So we have manual and auto over here in our block diagram where we normally uh, run. And then here we have uh, cascade and uh, regular set point switch. So if we were running a normal mode, this switch would be made to our set point and we would be controlling it. The operator would control it by changing its set point. When we switch it over to cascade, this link gets made. We're now receiving our signal from somewhere else. And this switch also makes uh, at the same time and it goes into auto and that allows a cascade function uh, to work. So usually the controller is in auto also when we're selecting cascade. Um, oh, one more thing about uh, reverse and direct acting controller. So one way that I remember reverse acting controllers and direct acting controllers is how we calculate error. Uh, and if you remember from second year, uh, error can be either set point minus PV or PV minus set point. I hope that reminds you of something. Um, but anyway, if I was to write error equals SP minus PV, that would reflect this situation here where I have PV as minus. And when I see minus PV, I just commit it to memory that I know that this is reverse acting controller. In a direct acting controller, um, the PV here would be positive and the SP over here would be negative. And that's another way that you can kind of do an easy uh, recollection of what's direct and what's reverse acting. 
Okay, so controller mode combinations. Now that we have three different options uh, and two different controllers, uh, each one of them can be in one of three different modes. So we've got a lot of different possibilities here. So we can have the primary in auto and the secondary in cascade. This is full on operating as a cascade control loop the way it should be with all of everything working uh, happily. Uh, the second way we could do it is primary and manual, secondary and manual. So this would be like a startup type situation. Uh, the third one here, we can have the primary and manual and the secondary in auto. We can have the primary and manual and the secondary in cascade. So there's a lot of different combinations here. Um, the main thing that you need to take away from this, aside from the fact that there are a multitude of different options, is that we need to be aware of something called bumpless transfer. And we've talked about bumpless transfer before, um, but in Cascade, we're going to talk about it a bit more. Uh, we're going to talk about a whole lot more in selective control um, because bumpless transfer comes into play whenever you have two controllers and there is a potential to turn one off or one on and the other one not being on the same page. And if they're not on the same page, then we get this big bump and that big bump causes drastic changes that may upset our plan. So we address bumpless transfer uh, a fair amount here in Cascade and then even more when we talk about selective. So if you don't understand bumpless transfer yet, make sure that you do. So now we're gonna look at uh, diagrams of each of these different modes and talk about some of the reasons why you need to do it if I haven't already mentioned it. Okay, so here we have primary and auto, secondary and cascade. This should be the normal fully operating cascade control loop. Uh, in this situation here, the operator can only change the set point of the primary controller. Okay, so again, our primary controller is gonna be our temperature transmitter, our temperature controller here, and you see our set point option. The operator changed the set point here. This controller, uh, primary controller, sends its controller output CO1 to the CAS2 input. I don't know why they changed the name here, but this would also be known as the RSP input for the secondary controller. And it does its magical thing and its controller output goes to the valve, controls the steam and la di da di da everything is working the way it's supposed to be. The second option is primary, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back here because I had my arrow on the wrong thing. So here's the set point, the operator can change on our primary controller. Set point goes through the controller, its controller output is fed into the CAS2 uh, input of the secondary controllers. This should be called RSP, this is what I was pointing at, and then it goes on and operates the loop as it should. Now we have primary and manual and the secondary and manual. This is where set point tracking uh, comes in, and this means that the set point of controller true has to equal the output of controller two, and this is to achieve bumpless transfer, okay? Also a unique feature called initialization mode happens uh, when we do this. Um, we'll talk about initialization mode a little bit more in the fourth year, but what it means is that the primary is taking direction from the secondary controller in order to provide bumpless transfer. In this application, the operator can only adjust the output of the secondary, uh, because when it is in a knit mode, the primary output cannot be adjusted. And you're going to learn about this in knit mode in little bits and pieces as we move forward uh, in the remainder of this course, but mostly uh, in the fourth year. So here we go. Uh, manual, you can see uh, manual is uh, selected here, and the signal is just going. Uh, back back in here. So uh, we're initialized. The controller output of one is equal to set point two. They're the exact same signal. If we were to switch one of these back to the other one here, that signal would be equal and we wouldn't have any problems. Third configuration here, primary and manual, secondary and auto. And I understand that you're probably not following along at this point anymore. Um, this will make a little bit more sense to you, hopefully, after you read uh, through this afterwards. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know what to say here. Recognize what the block diagrams look like and be able to, uh, be able to describe what's going on 
uh, exactly here, right? So you can tell that this one's in auto because auto is connected. Uh, you should be able to tell that this one's in manual because auto is not connected. It's mostly about the diagrams. I can't really elaborate it. It's it's a little bit much, I, I agree. But anyway, uh, primary and manual, secondary and auto. What happens here? Um, the operator can adjust only the secondary set point, right? Because it's in auto. So we can adjust the set point. Because the primary is in a knit mode, it can't be adjusted even though it's in manual, OK? A knit goes hand in hand with bumpless transfer. Okay, so this controller output signal is going in there, getting doing whatever magic it needs to do, and we're getting bumpless transfer. Don't don't break your heads over it. Okay, primary and manual, secondary and cascade. This application here, the operator can only adjust the output of the primary controller. PV1 is going to be set point two going to the cast two input and again this is a diagram here this is painful i agree but uh hopefully when you read through in the ilm it makes uh, a little bit more sense to you uh here you can see i can make my adjustment here in manual so that's wonderful pulling out of the archives here Pneumatic bumpless transfer. So bumpless transfer isn't new. It's been around forever. It's important. Um, we're going to just touch on pneumatics here real quickly. Um, in order to do this pneumatically, the controllers have to be tubed specifically for bumpless transfer. In order to do the switch from auto to manual, uh, there's a procedure which involves adjusting a manual loader in order to equal the controller outputs between the two controllers. Uh, and what happens is it moves a teeny little ball into this indicator zone. And when you get it into that zone, you can, it tells you about your balance between the two controllers and you can move that switch to manual. Um, it's the same thing to go the other way, but you have to adjust the set point to match. So switching from automatic to cascade is more or less the same procedure. Um, if you happen to work on pneumatic controllers, so there's not a lot left out there, but there are a few, make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructors, uh, instructions and procedures for all mode switching as they can be a little bit different. Um, I'll show you just real quick. This is what that manual unloader thing looks like. And you see here we've got the manual auto switch. So the idea here is you can vary the signal coming from the other controller, you get this ball to go in the middle point, and once that ball's in the middle point, you can make this switch, and you're not going to get a bump. So um, it can be done the old school way, it can be done the new school way. Uh, the new school way is obviously probably much easier. So digitally, or the new school way, uh, we set them up or program uh, for bumpless transfer. And again, regardless of whether it's pneumatic or digital, the key to any of this bumpless transfer stuff is to ensure that the output signal for a controller is balanced to the input signal from the other controller. How it's done varies a little bit from mode to mode. And again, in my opinion, maybe a little bit deeper than we need to know, but it is material that we have to look at. So when switching from manual to automatic, here's what basically happens. The process variable needs to equal the set point of the unselected controller right so whatever the current process condition is had to be has to be sent to the other controller so both controllers must have bumpless transfer and the set point must track the process variable so that when we switch it there is no error to react to and that's essentially all we're doing with bumpless transfer is making sure that the set point for the unselected controller is following the position of the selected controller so that when we switch, there's no bump. Okay, going from automatic to manual, again, both controllers must have bumpless transfer. When in automatic, the manual controller output follows the actual controller output, so there is no bump. And auto to cascade, when the secondary is switched from automatic to cascade, the controller output of the primary is programmed to follow the set point of the secondary. So if we went to switch back again, surprise, we wouldn't have that bump. 
This brings us into the next major conundrum, which is reset windup. Reset windup we talked about earlier uh, is the saturation of the integral mode of a controller that develops during times when control uh, when where control cannot be achieved. Uh, if you have two controllers and one of them is not currently working, uh, it's still receiving information, but it has no output going anywhere. So it's still comparing uh, set point process variable and it could have an error there. And if that error is sitting there for hours and hours and hours, it's gonna become saturated. And remember, saturation really is the same kind of thing as reset windup and is very bad. So um, if we were to switch at that point in time, the process would go uh, extremely wonky, um, not only extremely wonky to the end of one of its limits, but it's far beyond one of its limits. And it's gonna take some time to just get close to the limit and then more time to get back down to where it's happy. So reset windup, very bad, and we have to make sure that we don't let that happen. So how do we do that? We can do a number of different things. Um, one is we can restrict the controller's output values so that they are just beyond zero and 100%. So in the ILM, I think it says about minus 3.3 and 103.3. These numbers are arbitrary, um, but basically it's just saying we can only go so high. We can't go to 150 or 160 or we can't pile up error all day long. Um, the second thing we can do is restrict the amount that the bias setting can accumulate, and that would be done uh, through some settings. We can also re increase the reset action uh, by a factor of 8 to 32 times, and we've talked about this previously. Uh, and by increasing the reset action, basically what we're doing is allowing it to speed up the unwinding process uh, rather, than, rather than having to uh, wait and wait and wait. The best way, of course, here is to use external feedback for these control schemes where the controller's output is not currently selected. And we call this reset tieback or external feedback or something like that. Um, we have seen this before, so don't forget it because it's obviously pretty important if it's come up in a couple of different subjects. How do we do it with the pneumatic controller? So here's an interesting, confusing look at how a pneumatic controller kind of works, but the long story short here is, uh, this wraps up basically two controllers, uh, the flow controller and a temperature transmitter, and they act in coordination to each other. But you'll see that the final output signal that we get coming into this flow controller not only goes to the final control element, but it also goes back to the bias of this other controller. So the signal coming out here is the same as the signal coming out here. So when we switch, it doesn't cause any funky movement of the lever arm here. So this is how the primary is connected to the secondary and cascade. To prevent reset windup, the primary feedback signal is tied to the external feedback port. So here's that EF external feedback port. This limits it to the secondary's maximum output. In normal operation, with the primary and automatic and the secondary in cascade, the PV of the primary matches the set point and the controller output matches the external feedback and it's balanced. The external feedback signal is PV2, so it must match the remote set point. I'm probably lost, you guys, but whatever here we're going to keep on going uh, so when the pv is off it's set point it doesn't wind up because the external feedback is the ssis or the secondary slaver inner loops output uh, it's um it's a brainful i understand under abnormal operation when the secondary is not in this cascade this means that the output of the primary is not tied to the remote set point of the secondary, so flow won't change, an error will develop, but because the process variable two is tied to the external feedback, it won't. Yeah, very confusing. All right, let's get back to life here. Um, digital controllers. As with the pneumatic controllers, external feedback is used to eliminate reset windup. Also, putting the primary into a knit mode 
suspends it suspends its brain so it won't wind up and i that's a term or a phrase that i use uh, when you put it into a knit mode it basically doesn't want to do anything it's waiting for something some of the permissive to happen before it can to, can do anything so an initialized mode basically suspends its brain so it doesn't react so here's what happens digitally um, <clears throat> you can't change modes from auto to manual you can't adjust the set point or the output the primary master or output PID doesn't do anything anymore. The external feedback will track the set point of the secondary controller so that reset windup does not happen. And this tracking provides the bumpless transfer. So confusing, but that's the end of that little uh, area of darkness. Okay, so how do we prove that cascade control is faster? So again, benefits of cascade, upsets to manipulated variable are detected before they affect the primary variable, and the speed of the primary is increased because the secondary is responding faster than the primary can by itself. So the next bunch of slides, let me just have a quick look here. Uh, and I think there's a ton of them. Yeah, so from page 21, this isn't the worst part, so let's just look at this. So here's proof. Okay, conventional loop. Here we have our furnace and our regenerator here. Uh, what we've done is uh, we're doing a little test to see if this actually works. So we changed the manual output of the temperature controller, which is our primary controller, by 5%. Okay, so here we made an output change of 5%. The output of FY101, which is our secondary, rises up slowly here and flow increases. And in its T1 time, which is 8.8 .8 minutes, okay, it gets T1 in about 8.8 minutes. It takes the temperature transmitter TT301 right over here. This would be our uh, temperature, 31 minutes to get to set point. So this is a pretty long time. This is a conventional conventional loop. Okay, so eight minutes for the flow to uh, increase and 31 minutes for the temperature to catch up to that change. Pretty slow. Moving to a cascade version of the same loop here. So we're changing the manual controller output of the TIC by 5% here. The flow uh, increases very quickly. You can see now that the T1 time is now 3.2 minutes, which is much faster than the 8.8 .8 earlier. And our primary variable, the temperature, reaches its new happy point in 19 minutes. So the effective time constant of the inner loop uh, is reduced, which speeds up the performance of the primary loop. So Hard to, hard to argue that. You see it all, you see it all happening right in front of your eyes. So let's move on to tuning. Tuning for cascade is done inside out. That is, you turn this tune the secondary slave or inner loop first, and then the primary master or outer loop. Um, because of cascade, the secondary loop is going to have a higher gain value than normal. This is key to how it reacts faster. So in our normal uh, examples that we looked at, whether it's the exchanger or the furnace, uh, the temperature is the primary, the secondary is usually flow. And if we can make that flow gain higher than normal, it's gonna react faster than normal, which is gonna make the primary change faster than normal, which is all beneficial uh, and why we're doing it. Okay, so lots of different things here on tuning. Um, so we start out tuning the secondary loop. So in our exchanger example, this would be uh, the flow loop, okay? So generally we want quarter amplitude decay from our secondary and we want it fast. That's why uh, we're not having any kind of response that's over damped. We want quarter amplitude decay because it gets there pretty quick. We want it quick because we want to address any disturbances before they reach the primary. The higher the gain is, 
the faster it will be. Best usually, and there will be a little bit of discussion on this in the ILM, but generally speaking, the secondary uh, is going to be P only. Okay, if there's offset in the secondary and you can't handle it, you can add some integral, but remember adding integral, uh, integral can make it a little bit uh, unstable. We could also use derivative, um, but only on the process variable. If we use it on error, it will uh, be very noisy. Remember, flow is very quick and we kind of get those jagged, uh, those jagged lines. And anytime that jagged line crosses the set point, it's going to create an error and that's going to make things messy. Uh, so derivative, you can use it, but you don't usually use it. So normally the secondary uh, is going to be P only and pretty high gain. Um, you can use any tuning method you want. The primary must be in manual or in knit mode uh, when you're tuning the secondary. Otherwise, it's going to respond to any adjustments that you make. Okay, chain, tuning the primary. Uh, when tuning the primary, we must balance the control variable for performance, robustness, and behavior of the manipulated variable. So it's not just a matter of going and uh, tuning the flow valve uh, with a high gain and then uh, and then we put it in auto and then we go to the primary and we adjust our primary. There's, there's some things we have to consider, like how do we want the primary to react? Is it okay to be fast? Can we be slow? How robust is it? Um, and then in order to maintain performance and or robustness, does it come at the expense of our manipulated variable? For example, valve cycling. Uh, you've probably seen applications where you can keep your control variable pretty good and nice and stable. But in order to do that, your valve is cycling like crazy. So you've got to find a balance uh, between all of the different variables when you're tuning. So again, just like the secondary, um, you can use any tuning method you want. But when you're tuning the primary, the secondary must be in cascade mode because you're at that point tuning the whole, you're tuning the whole loop. So tune the secondary first, make sure it's working switch it into cascade and then go to the primary and then tune it uh, the best way that works for you and your process. <coughs> All right, so uh, how to tune cascade controls or five pages of tuning examples condensed into words. I've elected to leave most of the next bunch of pages out um, the, in my opinion, should be moved over to digital tuning. Uh, it's more or less a, a revisitation of digital controller tuning. So if you have any questions about it, uh, you can go back to that. But the next five or six or seven pages walk you through uh, a bunch of different, you know, the tuning process and what it looks like. So long story short, let's just get it out of the way here, what they say here. Always tune the secondary controller first. Take measurements of the secondary or inner loop and then tune it in either automatic using a Ziegler Nichols closed loop method or in manual using a reaction curve method. Tune the secondary controller as close to quarter amplitude decay as possible and make sure you select the appropriate control modes for that type of process. Normally it's going to be flow and normally it's going to be a high gain P only type setting. Next, tune the primary. Tune at the normal set point for that particular system. Remember, gains can change, so you tune at the normal operating point. The secondary controller must be in cascade because now we're tuning for the whole cascade loop. There are many, many scenarios to choose from, so choose the most important ones to you. Make sure you tune it for, for example, are you more concerned about the effects of load changes? Are you more concerned about the effects of set point changes? Um, can you, uh, do you have to do an open loop test to get your uh, baseline values? Can you do a closed loop test to get your mainline values? Uh, if you're in an operating plan, you're probably not going to be able to do a closed loop test. You might have to do an open loop test. So there's a bunch of different things that you have to consider. Okay, the next bunch of pages on the ILM uh, detail all the different tests that we just talked about 
um, in the previous slide, all the different processes and their responses. You can read all that stuff by yourself. Uh, hopefully you'll see by the end of it that Cascade uh, has helped. Okie dokie, using Cascade and dealing with set point nonlinearity. So valves and or process nonlinearities can be compensated for. And we've talked about this also in a previous uh, subject. So getting rid of nonlinearities uh, through multipoint characterization, getting rid of nonlinearities by dealing with uh, adaptive control strategies and dealing with nonlinearities by detuning the loop. So we can deal with set point nonlinearities these three ways. And this, this slide and the next slide are just talking about nonlinearity. So first set point nonlinearities, pretty standard toolbox. Process nonlinearities, same toolbox. So characterization, adaptive control, detuning, um, same practices in order to linearize both scenarios here. Uh, if the primary usually stays at one set point, you don't really have a problem with linearization, so you don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> All right, getting close to the end here. Uh, block diagrams typically where we end up here. So again, uh, be familiar with block diagrams. We've had a ton of them in this class here. Um, so taking a PID diagram like we have here and recognizing what its equivalent block diagram uh, would look like, uh, something that you could be asked. Um, you may see a block diagram for uh, a normal single loop type situation. You may see a block diagram for cascade. You may see a block diagram for selective control. Um, I might put them all on one question and say, which one is which? So um do try to understand the basic layout for uh block diagrams so here's the complicated version of a block diagram showing the primary controller secondary controller all the fancy goodies that we have out there and then of course there's a simplified version where we just talk about the primary controller and then we just kind of wrap up the secondary or inner loop all on this little block so either way uh, block diagrams are a big part of not only third year, but moving into fourth year, uh, pretty significant and should be a helpful tool for you to be able to diagnose what's going on in a control loop. So that wraps up our presentation today on cascade control. Um, hopefully you can uh, get a little bit more detail as you read through it yourself. There is a lot of information to go through there. Um, but again, long story short, Cascade is super duper popular, uh, used to alleviate any problems with manipulated variable before they affect the primary variable uh, involving a primary controller, a secondary controller. The secondary controller must be three to five times faster than the primary controller in order for it to be a benefit to us. And that is Cascade in a nutshell. That is the end. Have a great day. Wake up. It's Thank over. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Have a good day, Ty. Yep, ciao. Have a good day, boys. Yeah, see you guys.